Well, <laughs> fre frequently. <laughs> um, so, to, so I have introduced Tom in the best way that I know how, without going through the usual thing, 19 novels or whatever the number is now, I lose track. Um, you know, uh, Edgar Award winner for uh, The Butcher's Boy, his first novel, uh, nominated again after that, uh, winner of lots of awards of one kind or another, uh, a true master of the suspense novel, and also no small thing, the best-selling writer on the mysterious press list. Oh. Love that. Well, thank you. Uh, it, can you hear me? Is that a no? What? It's not working. <laughs> what do I do? I, I don't know. Tap it. Take this. There you go. There you go. Um, thank you, Adam. That was very nice. I, I realize this is my opportunity. Adam, I've written 27 novels. No. Just <laughs> didn't realize it. you could. Uh, you didn't pay me for the last five. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't publish them, so I don't care. I, don't care. I didn't really write them. It was just a ploy to get more money. That's all. Um, Good luck thank with you. that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very nice. I, uh, actually, I will not say anything more about, uh, about uh, the editor-author relationship until tomorrow. Say, right? We won't, to, we won't do that. Yeah, no, no. We, have an, we have an hour to talk about. We have an hour to talk about that tomorrow, and uh, and we will. There are things that I have to tell you. You have to believe. <laughs> no, really, that's a, that's a big important thing about about writing. If you're gonna, you know, write as a professional, that's that's gonna be a big part of your life. That's a big a big relationship, because the editor is is your book's home. You know, <laughs> your home is in his brain. So. He's the person that you deal with. And, uh, anyway, we'll talk about that tomorrow, right? We will. Yeah. But, uh, anyway, uh, I'm not sure where to go with this. Well, then I'll ask you a question. Here. Okay. How's that? Um, tell us about Jane Whitefield. Okay. Well, Jane Whitefield, <clears throat> like almost everything that uh, I've done in um, the book world, is, is the product of a disappointment and a mistake. I decided at some point, uh, I don't know, maybe 15 years or so into my career, that I was going to write the Great California Earthquake book. And I uh, spent about, well, nearly a year um, working on this, this great tome. I uh, decided I would have this morning earthquake, which would occur, and it would be an enormous quake which would set off a second quake and would you know utterly destroy Los Angeles. And I had people all over the world. That's this is another secret. It's, you know, when you're a writer, you're playing. I was setting up the dominoes and I was gonna sweep the board. But uh, you know I had all of these these uh, characters all over the place. They were everywhere in Los Angeles and I had gotten a hold of the state's contingency plans which would show which um, five foot in diameter gas pipe would blow up where, um, what viaducts would fall down on my head, things like that when the earthquake was going to come. And I, I studied it and I studied uh, uh, sort of the, the latest on earthquake stuff and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I had these 10 characters or so all over the place and all, each of their lives would be destroyed in this one moment or changed in some way. Um, and uh, I was up to, I forget exactly what it was, it was something like 765 pages <laughs> at the moment when I thought, hey, I'm nowhere near done yet. And so I gave it to Joe, my wife, who is uh, my former writing partner in television and has a PhD in English and is a writer and is absolutely the person that always sees things first. Uh, and she went away for, you know, sort of was busy looking at it for about two days and then she brought it back to me and, and said, this is so awful, I can't even finish it. <laughs> so it it's so boring. And uh, you know, I, I realized uh, perhaps she was right. And um, actually, as Tony Broadbent said today, uh, uh, someone says something's wrong with your book, they're always right. And if they say what you should do about it, they're always wrong. <laughs> well, you know, in this case, she was certainly right. And uh, so I decided that I would probably uh, 
be best to make it one of our priceless family treasures, which is a manuscript that goes into a closet and is never seen again by anyone who's not related to you by blood or marriage. <laughs> and uh, so I, I thought I would write about the part of the country where I grew up, which was the western end of New York State, along the Niagara River. And I began to do what I often do is uh, sort of learn about a place through its history. I started reading about the history of it, and I realized very quickly that the um, most important and interesting things that ever happened in that part of the world, in that part of the country, uh, happened before Europeans ever showed up. And I, I realized that probably the best way to, uh, to come to an understanding of, of this place is to have somebody who could see, see the area in a historical context so that this person would know that Main Street in Buffalo becomes Route 5 going across the state and it is what used to be the Wahakwaneu, which is the, the Iroquois path to war. You know, went from one end of the state to the other and then it continued down along Lake Erie and westward and it also took a swing down so they could attack the Cherokees and the Catawbas and the Creeks and so on. Um, and you know, it's, she would know the history of it as well as what it's like now. She would be a modern woman who uh, lived there and knew things and so on. Um, but also, there's a there's a mythic element that I wanted to have, the sense that uh, among the Iroquois, the gods lived somewhere. And you know, if you wanted to go visit Hino the Thunderer, you would go behind Niagara Falls, where it's really loud where he lives. You know, that's the sound of his thunder. Um, you know, places that, that uh, have always been inhabited and, and it's been kind of interesting. So I started thinking, okay, well I want, I want this character to be somebody who is uh, doing something illegal. And I knew already that uh, it's a lot more profitable <coughs> to, for instance, uh, sell a California driver's license than it is to make a $20 bill. And it's a hell of a lot easier, at least it was in those days. Um, so I thought, okay, well, I'll start thinking about maybe people, uh, you know, who, who are changing identities, and you know, have this person, you know, help that, help with that. And I thought, well, you know, what sort of illegal activity would a woman actually want to be involved in? And I realized that it was saving people from being murdered. That is, that uh, you know, no matter what you do in order to give somebody a new identity, uh, if you're saving them from being murdered, you're sort of in the right. You're doing the, the right thing. It's the kind of situation that she would be in. And I, I realized also, as I read about the uh, Native Americans of that area, I realized that it's very close to what, what they did as a normal routine. That is, they adopted huge numbers of people. Uh, you know, at, at one point in 1632, a Dutch visitor came to a, a uh, village of the Oneidas in central New York State and, and counted uh, 11 different nationalities of Indians that were uh, that lived there because they were all adopted by the, the Iroquois who were fighting constantly and every time somebody would get killed they would you know bring somebody else in and they would give them a new identity new relatives a role in society <coughs> and so on so that you know in, in a sense they were a really complicated society so once I got sort of rolling on that uh, I uh, you know Jane sort of came into being and that's that's where she came from. That's a very long answer. I'm sorry it was, but it was. Oh, and uh, it was okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just, uh, just to give a little more context, what Jane does is, uh, I mean, you sort of talked around it a little bit, uh, but what Jane does is she will, somebody will find her, who is uh, who witnessed a crime, for example, uh, and really bad guys want to kill that person. And Jane helps that person vanish. She, uh, they, she uh, helps him or her uh, find a new identity to get uh, the documents that is necessary to uh, to establish a new life and uh, and a trail, a way to get away, physically move away and hide the fact that that, that person has moved. Uh, and it is done. When, when Tom writes it, it is done with such extraordinarily meticulous 
care about things that you and I have never thought about in a thousand years. And he thinks about it. And he and is and is very and it's believable. And it all is believable against all odds. Well, um, as the series has gone on, this has become harder to do. <laughs> you know, I, when I first started writing about Jane and, and uh, Buck Vanishing Act about 20 years ago or so, uh, she walks into an airport, plunks down 500 bucks, and says, "You know, I want to get to New York." My name is Destiny Beaucluse, you know. She doesn't have to have any <laughs> any ID or anything. Nobody ever, you know, was at, at that time nobody was being asked for identification to go and get onto an airplane and you could, you know, buy it for cash and step on the plane. Um, now, you know, there's a huge industry of, of people all over the country who whose only job is to make sure nobody does what Jane does. And, uh, you know, so it's gotten a little trickier, but it's a lot of fun. It's always fun to do it. And I, of course, you know, as I read things that are going on in the, in the country, you know, I always sort of make a little note of something that, that I might be able to use. And as the years have gone by, people have begun to send them to me on the internet, which is really fun. <laughs> I just got one, a, a group of things um, from a retired government librarian in Texas. Uh, this week, who uh, pointed me to 46 publications uh, by the IRS for training their agents to find various kinds of money laundering in 46 industries. The only one I've read so far is the reforestation industry. And, uh, you know, but it's, it's, it's insane. You, just, you get all this stuff from people and, they, you know, they'll tell you and you can use it in your next book. People are so generous about this stuff, too. Mm -hmm. They really are. It's another guy who explained to me all that stuff, like when you go into a hotel and you have your, your credit card run for 100 bucks uh, to see whether you're going to really pay your, <laughs> or let's say whether your, your credit card is real, right? And what happens to that money and how long they hold it and, you know, how it gets back without, you know, uh, essentially being traced to your card and so on. You know, it's really, a, it's great how people will, will tell you things. Um, this is not off subject, although it sounds like it. Um, I just want to say what a great bookshop book passage is. And seriously, 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 I was looking at the mystery section. I was looking for my books. Uh, but I was also looking at it in general. And I was looking at Tom's books. And in addition to the new book, uh, String of Beads, there's a lot of backlist books. And the first book that I published by Tom, although it's not a Jane Whitefield, is one of my favorite of all of Tom's books. And I've read virtually all of them. Uh, for my sins, you know. Just, uh, a, a book called Silence. And here's a bunch of Tom's backlist. There's one copy of this, three copies of that, two copies of that. And there's like eight copies of Silence, one of Tom's best books. So it's just amazing that this store is able to do that kind of thing. Now, the reason I'm thinking of silence is it's the same kind of character who is helping somebody, uh, a private eye, who is helping somebody escape with a new identity. A lot of the same traits that Jane Whitefield brings to her books. Why did you not use Jane Whitefield in that book instead of the private eye? Well, what I was doing in this case was inventing the, the anti-Jane, because what he did was 10, I think it's, I don't know, it was 10 years, seven years or something ago, he had helped this woman escape. He was a police officer, Los Angeles police officer. And what he did was he decided you know, she was in terrible danger and there was nothing to, that he could prove against anybody, but he knew that she was next. And so what he did was to use his knowledge of how police look for people. And he, you know, helped her to get documents that she could use to get other documents, which would validate those in turn. And uh, he then essentially drives her to a, a crossroads and says, don't tell me where you're going. You know, never, never get in touch with me again. Never tell me 
where you are. You know, it's, it, it's never going to be safe for you to contact me. And I don't want to be in a position where I have to uh, be asked under oath where you are. Um, so she goes away. Seven years later, uh, he realizes that he's got to find her. Okay. He needs to get to her again because um, well, it's sort of a complicated thing involving her former uh, fiance. But you know, he's got to find her. And so, in other words, what I'm doing there is is reeling somebody back in again. And how do you do that? You know, you remember how much you told her, what, what you told her to do. You know, how are you? Is you know, how much knowledge does she have now that, that you don't know about that you didn't give her? Things like that. So he's got to go find her, and that that was that was fun. It was sort of uh, the anti gene An extraordinary book. It really is uh, the first book in the Jane Whitefield series. And we'll talk about something else other than Jane Whitefield because Tom's written many other books. Uh, but it's the new book and. Uh, and it's just such a great series. It's so unusual. It, it's different. Uh, it's hard. There's a lot of mysteries written every year. Uh, and a lot of very good writers are writing them. It's really hard to come up with an original character. Truly original. Truly different from everybody else. And Jane Whitefield is that character. Um, I had a thought. It just totally vanished. Um, uh, oh, I know. The uh, the first Jane, I just want to mention this, the first Jane Whitefield book, Vanishing Act, was picked by the Independent Mystery Booksellers of America as one of the hundred great books of the century. Uh, just, just to let you know that it's not just us talking about how terrific these books are. It's all, at a time when there were a whole lot of mystery bookshops in America, about a hundred, I think, voted on it. Uh, you know, it made me feel good. It's great. I, you know, it's fun. I, the thing about Jane, which is really weird, when you have a series, I always said I'd never do a series. I said never, never do it. You know, and just be going over your own tracks over and over and over again. It'll be exactly the same. And uh, you know, but then of course, uh, what happened was when I finished that first book, I, I was sort of sad because I realized that I, I would would miss her. Like I, I had said everything <laughs> that I wanted to say about that story, but I hadn't said everything about her. And so I started, you know, kind of tinkering around with a, a uh, another story about her, and what she would be doing next. And my then editor, this is pre Otto, this is before Otto was born, <laughs> uh, was right. Uh, a guy named Joe Fox at uh, Random House. And um, you may know the name Joe uh, Joe Fox because he's the the villain in the the <laughs> that. Uh, Bookstore mail. thing. What was the, what's the name of the? You've got me. Right. Yeah. And it was it was named after show. <laughs> but anyway, he he called me up. He used to you know editors do that occasionally. Some of them do. They call you up and say like working on anything, you know. And uh, and I said yeah, you know I'm sort of thinking about this and and uh, this Jane character and I kind of like to fool around with another story and and uh, he said okay well you know good luck. And he called me back about an hour later, and he said, how'd you like to make it five? <laughs> so what he did was, you know, he said, uh, you know, in a sense, I was, I was going to say to him something like, well, I've decided I would never do a series. But, you know, of course, I said, of course, you know. So I wrote the five books. But the, the kicker in it was that I had to have a new Jane manuscript on his desk in New York ready to publish every June 15th for five years. So I kind of changed that changed my view of, uh, of writing and, and what else I could be doing at the same time and so on. Um, you know, in a way it changed me more than it did anything else. So it was a different thing. And having that experience of writing a series was actually, it was instead of being, uh, you know, the, the terrible ball and chain that I thought it was going to be, it was actually pretty fun and I liked it. And you could, it allows you to think farther ahead. And say to yourself, well, I'm not writing just this one story. I'm writing a story that's going to be five volumes long. <clears throat> and then I got to the point where I was ready to uh, finish. I was working on the, the fifth book. And the editor who succeeded Joe Fox when he died, Joe died at his desk in that random house um, during a work day. 
Um, anyway, the next editor called up and said, um, what are you doing? You know, are you working on anything? I said, yeah, I'm working on the last Jane Wakefield book. And, you know, I've got this great thing set up. And uh, she said, don't kill her. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to do. <laughs> and I thought, uh, and, but the reason that she was going to die was that uh, she was going to violate her own principle, which is that she wasn't going to get revenge for anybody. Didn't believe in revenge. You know, she would always tell her clients, um, you know, you if you want justice or you want revenge, go get it. Uh, if you want to run away, I'll help you. And um, so what was going to happen was that his, he, her husband was going to get killed and she was going to go to get revenge. And of course on page 132 or so, she would uh, turn the corner and somebody would see her before she saw them and she would die. And I, I pictured the readers going like, what? <laughs> and then reading backwards for a couple of pages to see you know, if that really happened. But no, I didn't get to do that. So <laughs> anyway, what the, what the editor said was, if you kill your main character that you have talked people into liking, they will never forgive you. And they'll, you know, they'll actually be angry at you. And uh, you know, so I thought, okay, well, this sounds like a, you know, and she said also, if you, if you do that, you're gonna uh, absolutely for certain think of a story that you would just love to tell with her in it and they won't let you. You know, nobody will want to read it because it'll be like Dallas. <laughs> Bobby Ewing isn't dead. So I thought, okay, we'll, we'll leave her alive, but uh, then I will, uh, I'll, now that I'm done with this contract, I will uh, you know, go back to writing standalone novels. So I wrote, I don't know, four or five of them, and, and people started to write me emails. You know, uh, where's Jane? When's the next Jane book coming out? And I would try to, to say, well, oh, well, I have this other book that just really, you know, they didn't want to hear it. You know? uh, and then finally, after a certain point, I got a, an email that said, have you retired or are you dead? <laughs> <laughs> I had to pick. <laughs> and, uh, so I decided to kind of bring her back. But I, <clears throat> I had always said I would, I would at some time, you know, like to turn back to her and so on. But then I realized, it had been like nine years since I had done it. I was having a great time writing all those other things. So, so I brought her back. You know, it's, it's fun. It's been a, a fun thing to write about her. And I actually find that, that I, I begin to miss her if I don't write about her for a while. I begin to think about what, you know, what she's doing. <laughs> so, yeah. your, your editor gave you good advice because uh, uh, as many of you know, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle killed Sherlock Holmes um, after uh, two novels and two collections of short stories. And there was uh, such public rage uh, that Conan Doyle had done this. Uh, one woman wrote to him, and he wrote about this in his autobiography, and addressed the letter, you beast. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he wound up bringing, uh, Arthur, he wound up bringing back Sherlock Holmes in the Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, a, a, an adventure that occurred before Holmes was killed, which is an option if you're if you're going to do that. But yeah. but it was good advice that uh, yeah. that he got. I think it was just, you know, made it. Uh, there, there was the problem though. I didn't realize how much time had gone by, and so I didn't. I couldn't have her age nine years. You know, I, I slowed down her aging. Up until then, I had uh, had a situation where she would age one year after each book. And she would know whatever it was that happened that she had learned in the last book. And so I was keeping up with that and she would, you know, begin to have sort of memories of what she had, had done in the past and, and so on. But then all of a sudden nine years go by and I go, oh my God, what am I gonna do? So she's she aged about four years. So. That's enough. And, Dog years. Um, and just just uh, to mention uh, your other most successful series. Uh, the Butcher's Boy, the, the very first book that you wrote, uh, The Butcher's Boy, was uh, won the Edgar's best first novel, and uh, it was about a hitman, uh, a cold-blooded <laughs> killer, and you made him sympathetic. How did you do that? Uh, 
Well, actually, that was that was part of the fun of that too. Okay. So, what I did was um, made sure that for the first, I think it's 32 pages or so, you never see anything from anybody else's point of view. Everything that you see is through his eyes, and it's colored by what he's thinking. And so I, you know, sort of carrying along, doing all this stuff, and uh, and having him actually commit a murder uh, in Denver. So it's not here. They can't can't arrest me here. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, did sort of went along and, and made sure you never got anybody else's sense of what things were until at a certain point I was waiting for the reader to uh, sort of look up from the book and say, hey, you know, this is the bad guy. This is a terrible person. And then, you know, by that time if you're hooked, then, then it'll work. But, you know, it was a, one of the things that's oddest about that book was that I, you know, I had been writing for like 12 years, or since I was like 12 years old or something, I was one of those people that would would think of the perfect thing to say about five minutes after the other person walked away. And so I started writing, you know, a few things with characters in it who could say these things. And I would write those down and that worked pretty well. It was nice and I kept writing, writing, writing and stuff. And, you know, got to be an English major. I had English major's disease, which was to, uh, you have to write a, a first novel when you're an undergraduate, you know. It was about as bad as you can imagine. And, uh, but when I finished The Butcher's Boy, you know, I finished that manuscript, I had no idea what to do with it. You know, how do you go about doing anything with this? And then I, I, what happened was I was really lucky. There was a, an article in the Atlantic Monthly, um, I think it was the Atlantic anyway, it was a, a magazine like that, in which a, a journalist decided to prove that it was impossible for an outsider to ever get anything published in this country. And uh, what he did was uh, this journalist typed up the first hundred pages of the National Book Award winner from the previous year, which was Wallace Stegner's The Spectator Bird. Mm -hmm. And he put his own name on it, and he sent it to all the major publishing houses in the United States. And he began to get answers back, and he, the answers were always the same. Nobody recognized it, and nobody thought it should be published. <laughs> and so the next month, uh, there was this, this the whole, bunch of, of uh, nasty letters from publishers in the United States, you know, who <coughs> had, had sent to them. And they said, how can we possibly, you know, pick this out from over the, the transit? How can we know that this is, you know, going to be so great? Because um, that isn't the way we do business. The way we do it is that agents will bring manuscripts to us that they have read and vouch for, and they will, you know, submit them to us and, and tell us, you know, what's going on. He's, okay. So the next month, uh, what he did was to retype, or to recopy, I guess, the uh, first 100 pages of Spectator Bird and send it to all of the major editors in the United States. I mean, major, uh, let's say, I'm sorry, agents, agents in, the, in the New York. The way, way he did that was he got, he wrote to the Authors Guild and got uh, a list that, that the Authors Guild had compiled of you know, reputable agents in New York who you know, worked regularly with major publishers. And so he sent the manuscript to every one of those. Nobody recognized it, and nobody <laughs> thought it should be published. But you know, and what he was trying to do really was to make this point and to show us that you know, everything's hopeless. But what he actually did was to show me how to do it, how to go about it. Because what I did was I wrote to the Authors Guild and got that same list. It was a little blue pamphlet. I don't know if it's a little blue pamphlet with a list, an alphabetical list of, of reputable agents, you know, and uh, meaning, you know, agents that uh, don't charge you to help you or whatever, you know, in other words, they're good people. And, um, I wrote, oh yeah, and also he had, he had learned to write a, a, a synopsis of uh, the Spectator Bird and to write a letter of inquiry. And so I did exactly the same thing and I started going down that list of agents. And fortunately, there was a man whose name began with a B <laughs> who answered me. His name was Lurton Blessingame. And he was an elderly gentleman who, uh, you know, was a reputable agent and he, he wrote me a little letter. In those days, we wrote letters through snail mail, and his were a little, little like that. 
and he said, uh, who are you? Tell me something about yourself. And so I wrote him back telling him who I was. Uh, and then he said, well, um, send me the manuscript. I'll read it. Another one of those little letters. This is, all this stuff takes weeks and weeks, right? <laughs> so, so I sent him the manuscript. And in two weeks, he sold it to Suzanne Kirk at uh, Scribner's. Happy story, you know? Your life changes all of a sudden. That's really a nice feeling. Not, not so much all of a sudden. You, well, you, you did a lot of work. <laughs> you, have to, you have to be persistent, of course, but you know. And you, and you didn't want to write series, but now you've written two more Butcher's Boys books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Butcher's Boy thing is, is, see, when I, like a lot of people, in the first novel, the character starts out pretty much very similar to you. You know, it's, he was exactly my age. He was sort of my physical description at the time. He wasn't bald <laughs> uh, at the time, anyway. Uh, and, you know, he sort of went along and, okay, 10 years passed. And at the end of 10 years, I think to myself, you know, I'm 40 now. And um, I feel really different from the way I did 10 years ago. I wonder what he's doing, what he's like. You know, I, I would no longer be a person who might put a, uh, take the shelf from a, a closet in a, a, a hotel room and prop it across two balconies to crawl across a 10th floor uh, window, get into the other guy's apartment. Uh, but I'm a lot sneakier and I'm a better liar. And uh, you know, what would, what, what would he be like? And so I wrote uh, this second uh, the edition or you know, adventure of, of The Butcher's Boy. And uh, again, strange things begin to happen. In this particular case, uh, the first thing was that Random House published or, or printed the, um, let's see, the ARC, the advanced reader's copy, 2,000 some copies, and sent them off to all of the reviewers and you know, people who were going to buy books all over the country, uh, bookstore owners, and so on. And they they discovered after they'd all gone out that all of the, that the gatherings mm -hmm. of this volume were sewn together in in the wrong order. Oh, God. So that what they got was so they were <coughs> page one through thirty, page sixty four through uh, eighty nine, and uh, three hundred through. <laughs> you know, through 313 and on and on. It went that way all the way. And then all they could think of to do was they, they printed an errata sheet. And I, I you know, it was sort of a kit to tell you how to put the book back in the world. And, you know, I've actually seen it in recent years. There was, uh, you know, sometimes somebody will bring you a really old book to sign. And, uh, you know, the, I got one a couple of years ago that actually had the errata sheet in there. And uh, anyway, what that did was several things. One was that there were some peculiar reviews. There were two reviews in particular that I remember. One said, the book is curiously disjointed. <laughs> <laughs> the plot seemed somewhat confused. <laughs> and the worst, actually, was that uh, because of this, they held up the publication of the book for about, I don't know, three, four weeks. And at the, at the time, um, Christopher Lehman Haupt, the re reviewer for the, the New York Times of, in those days, mm -hmm. the dreaded Christopher Lehman Haupt, I mean, <laughs> think, um, he was actually a pretty scary critic. Uh, James Atlas, I don't know if you know the name James Atlas, but he's a, a nonfiction writer who is quite well known. And he wrote this thing in the New Yorker a couple of years ago about how uh, he had written a first novel at one point. And it was pretty well received. And so he started, as anyone would, a second novel. And just at that point, Christopher Lehman Hawke's review came out of his uh, first book. And he took the uh, page out of his typewriter, <laughs> put it down, and never wrote another word of fiction again. <laughs> anyway, what Christopher Lehman Hawke did you know, at this point was, for me, he had written this glowing review. It was a wonderful review. And was what, what uh, at the time my editor said was a, a selling review, right? Which 
appeal to me because that implied money, right? Um, but it appeared three weeks early in the New York Times before the book came out. So it had no effect, whatever. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it was a you know, wonderful, uh, wonderful moment. And he also wrote a terrible review of, of uh, another book, actually, which, in which he said, um, and all of this just so that this character can disappear and never be heard from again. We wish him Godspeed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was the kind of critic he was. He was me. Uh, we're running out of time, so I think this might be a nice time if you have some questions for Tom that uh, we can try that. Yes, yeah, I'm just wondering if you um, try out the things that you have Jane do to say it really, really work, or how do you do it? I'm too much of a coward to do that. Right? Well, let, me, let me repeat, because oh, okay. not, uh, and most people back there. The question is, uh, does Tom actually try out the things that Jane does yeah. to see if they work? No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. You know, like, you know, whatever Jane does is, is really illegal. I mean, like, seriously illegal. What I've done, though, is that I do pay attention to reality to the extent that I can. And what Jane has had to do is pretty much what any fugitive has had to do in the last you know, 20 years or so, which is to go way under. You can't fly, for instance. It's just not, the risk is too, is too great. You have to basically travel by car. You don't do anything that's going to put you in certain places. Like, uh, you don't want to be where there are a lot of cameras. You don't want to be on uh, interstate highways where you're going to go through booths that are uh, going to take your picture and, and the picture of your car if you're you know, if somebody's looking for you. Uh, there's a lot of things that she really can't do that she once did. So, uh, yes? How did you come up with her being deaf, uh, Seneca, and what type of research did you do for the Native American collection? Oh, um, you, I, you that, the question. Oh, well, how did, why did I decide to make her a Seneca, make Jane Whitefield a Seneca? Um, really because those are the people that are in that part of the country. In other words, they were the people that, that were there uh, you know, for the last few thousand years, and, um, and they are still there. Fortunately for them, at the end of the Revolutionary War, there were still 2,000 Senecas out in the field, fully armed, who had never done anything in their lives except fight. So it wasn't a thing where George Washington could have said, you know, well, we'll just keep fighting you guys. You know, it wouldn't have been worth that. It would have been a costly thing. And so the the Senecas are pretty much where they were uh, at the first contact. Um, what I the reason I picked her or picked a Seneca was because I wanted somebody who really knew all the things that I wanted to have be the furniture of her mind. You know, I wanted her to know the place in that particular way. Yes. In Metzger's dog, you shut down the entire LA freeway system, which I thought was one of the most brilliant developments ever. <laughs> but did that stem, I always wondered, from any personal bitterness or what that mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say I see that I saw the possibilities. You know, at that time, I worked at USC, and I live in the valley, in the San Fernando Valley. And driving there was every day gave me an opportunity to contemplate. <laughs> and I sort of wondered what was what was on the road ahead of me. Anyone else? Okay. I had a question about the research with the other side of it. The, how did you research the, all the illegal activities? How to make someone disappear? How to do the counterfeiting? I mean, did you? Well, the, 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 yeah, you the, do the, question, the question is, how did you do the research yeah. to learn how to make people disappear? Well, I mean, several things happen. One is that you look at the possibilities and think of new <coughs> things. But also, there's a lot of stuff that you can find out that you know, people will tell you. And uh, you know, things that just sort of drift your way. And you, if you're writing about this regularly, you, you begin to collect them. They stick to your mind. But there are things like, um, you know, it's interesting. I ran across a book that I that I was really sort of too late for for inventing Jane, but later on I just ran into it. It's a, 
a book by a journalist who had been uh, researching people who simply disappear voluntarily. And he, as he was doing this sort of freelance journalism stuff, he uh, would always ask, or often ask people, do you know anybody who's actually disappeared, who's living under a different name and all that stuff? I'd really like to talk to somebody who does that. And so he began to do that. He got a whole bunch of people at various times to uh, agree to meet him. And it was funny because the men, one and all, would say that the reason why they left was because they wanted to go fishing. <laughs> you know, and they would he would find them in places like you know Mexico or something. They'd be running a tour boat or a you know a, a fishing boat or something like that for tourists, and and uh, he'd have these conversations with them. And it was basically they wanted to escape from some sort of responsibility or death or, or bad relationship or something. The women, however, all made agreements that they would meet him and, and tell him their story. None ever showed up. Not one. And it, you know, they were running from real things. They were running from some, you know, something bad. And so they never you know, came to see him. But anyway, there are all kinds of things like that that you pick up as you go along. And you know, you hear people who are, you know, a friend of a friend of a friend is, you know, had to leave Ohio, and she's, you know, living here and doing this or that, you know, things like that. And you begin to figure out how they do it. Yes. How many times have the books been optioned? Because they're so cinematic. Uh, I'm uh, sure. the, the question is how many of the book of Tom's books have been uh, optioned? The Jane books. Oh, the Jane books? Yeah. Yeah, the Jane, Jane books. Jane books were, uh, the first Jane book was optioned uh, actually a year before it came out, mm -hmm. which was 1991, I think, when the option, the first option, and they were in, optioned for 14 years in a row. And then I, uh, I took them out of option because I was you know, writing another one and I, I thought, well, it would, be, um, it would be great to sell this movie now, maybe. You know, it'll be right. bigger, a bigger dollar. <laughs> um, it wasn't, but I you know, it went back into option and you know, they've sort of been optioned on and off ever since. Um, so I guess they've just probably been optioned about 20 20 sometimes. Yeah. The, the Butcher's Boy was an option for the first 19 years. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, you're waiting for a movie, right? When you're a young writer, you think, oh my God, you know, my movie's going to be out there next year. And it's, you know, uh, no, and for Jane, you know, there, there are actresses who uh, were born, <laughs> grew up, <laughs> became famous, passed through sort of Jane's time and, and have retired already. <laughs> but I would have liked to have play Jane, but right. you know, uh, these things happen. It's a, you know, a lot of things get optioned, not many of them get made. So. It's Anyone else? Perfect. It's all good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like you said. Yeah, uh, just two unrelated questions. First, uh, are there some writers who have most inspired you, and, and who are they? And then second, um, do you think you could successfully disappear, and could your wife find you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of a special thing. Um, I'll answer that one first. Yes, she could find me. She knows everything I know, and, and is uh, you know the first one to read anything that I write, so she knows exactly what I know. Uh, but yeah, she could could do it. She's also smarter than me. Um, Writers that have, that have affected me, I, you know, probably the most important one in a way is, uh, is Faulkner. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on Faulkner. Um, but everything, everything I read affects me, it, it all, you know, sticks for a day or two at least. And, and uh, you know, I think we all, we all have to also look at the, the things that, uh, like what Faulkner used to call his lumber room was, uh, he imagined his brain as like a, a place where you, you know, kind of keep those scraps, and they were made up of things like the King James version of the Bible and Shakespeare and Keats and, you know, a number of other things. And I think, you know, we are we're all like that. I think we have all these bits of, of great things that we've read uh, that are always sort of rattling around in the backs of our minds. They affect how we write prose. So. Okay, uh, just to let you know the pamphlets that I told you about before, 
on a little table in the back. And uh, please your, help yourself to one, and I hope you enjoy it. And thank you so much for being with us.